Hello, it's Chris P. Williams here. Today I've got a tutorial for you looking at the histogram and the various scopes available to you within Affinity Photo. I'm going to explain how the scopes and histogram work and give you some working examples. So let's kick off now with this picture of a color checker. Now the histogram is found in the top right corner palette of your Affinity Photo workspace. If it's not visible amongst these headings, just simply go to view studio and then use the drop down and select histogram now what a histogram does it gives you a visual representation of the colors available in your image it's made up of a range of colors from our darkest colors on the left which are our blacks and our brightest colors on the right which are our whites and then in the middle we should find our mid grays now i'll demonstrate that quickly by using my crop tool and I'm just going to crop on my mid, mid gray square. And there you can see we're left with one peak in the middle. So the only color visible in our image as it stands is mid gray. So I just control and Z that to undo. Okay, uh, similarly now, if I go to the crop tool again, and I'm just going to crop this area black and I'm going to press enter. And again, we're left with a peak on the left hand side, which is representing our blacks. And if I click on our info palette, which is in the bottom right corner of the workspace, and likewise, if it's not there, go to view studio and select it from there. And you can see here that when I hover my mouse over the black color, the RGB values show zero, zero, zero. So that is absolute black and it's placed on the histogram exactly where it should be. So I'm just going to press control and Z now to return to the full color checker. Now, one thing you'll notice is the color peaks are all more or less the same height. And we can see the white peak is the same height as all the other colors, which is what we should expect. And the black peak is longer. And the reason for this is the peak size also indicates the number of pixels of a particular color that are available in our image. And in this case, you can see that the highest peak on our histogram is the black peak. Now I can demonstrate this to you. Right, I'm just going to crop the whole of this gray square, or a big portion of it, and a smaller portion of the gray square next to it. And now you can see that because black is no longer the dominant color in our image, the peak has reduced. And our dominant color is now this light gray to the left. And you can see here that's represented in this tall peak. So that's telling us the predominant color in our image is the light gray and the slightly darker gray is our second most dominant color. So hopefully you can see from that how the histogram doesn't only represent a spread of colors, it also represents a number of pixels of a particular color in your image. So I'm just gonna press Control and Z now to return to our histogram. And also before I move on, as I alluded to earlier, you can actually switch between various color channels. So for instance, rather than looking at all of my colors in one go, I can break it down to the RGB channels, the red, green, and blue. So I'll just do red there, and you can see there we've got multiple red peaks. And these will relate to all of the colors in the color checker that incorporate the red color. So probably purple, pink, red, and perhaps orange. If I switch to green, you can see, again, there are multiple squares on our color checker that include the color green. And we'll drop now to the blue channel. And again, we're left with multiple peaks because again, there are multiple colors on the color checker that incorporate the color blue. And again, the observant of you will see there's a peak on the right indicating a white color, even though we're looking at the blue channel. And that's because the white is made up of a mixture of red, green, and blue. And I can demonstrate that now by going to the crop, cropping that and pressing enter. You can see we're left with that peak. And if I switch to green, you can see the peak is there and switch to red, you can see the peak is there. So it's, so white is actually made up of all three colors in equal amounts. And that tells me that this is a perfectly white balanced white. And this is indicated here on our info palette. We've got the RGB and they're all at zero. Okay, so I'm just gonna go back to our all channels view and I'm gonna press control and Z to return to my color checker. Right, hopefully that explains to you how the histogram works and you can use it to identify colors and the amount of color in your images. So how does this work in the real world? Right, to demonstrate that, I'm just gonna to go to this image I prepared earlier 
of a cat. I took this photo recently on a holiday in Venice and we can see the colors a little bit muted. The picture is quite nice com composition wise and it looks a little bit dull. So we're going to use a histogram now to liven things up. Right, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at my black point and my white point in my image. And to do this, I'm just going to turn on my show clipped highlights and my show clipped shadows buttons. And basically what these allow me to do is I can slide my black point and what I'm waiting for is I'm waiting for these blue areas to appear, these blue overlays. This is the black point indicator doing its work. It's now telling me where my blacks are clipped. And what I like to do is drop that down until they begin to disappear and then drop the amount by maybe three to four percent and that gives me a nice starting point then for my blacks and similarly I want to now raise my whites so to do this I'm just going to push my brightness up towards the right and what I'm trying to do here now I don't want to go too far and I don't want to trigger my highlight indicator because if I did my photograph would be overblown and overexposed and the reason I know that is because I took this photograph in the shade so I wouldn't expect to see any clipped highlights I wouldn't expect to see even any specular highlights so I'm going to use this windowsill as a reference and I know roughly that the windowsill is positioned here in my image because it is the brightest point in my photograph and I'm just going to demonstrate this now by cropping on the windowsill and you can see there the three colors that make up my windowsill the dark is being blue and the light is being red but it's a mixture of of those three colors so I'm going to control and Z now to return to the full image and I'm going to place these three peaks roughly where I think they should lie and using the histogram now what's important here is don't rely on the histogram, okay? Always rely on your eyes. Always refer back to your photographs. So make your adjustments and look at your photograph, but use the histogram as a guide. So I'm trying to get this green peak, the middle peak, roughly roughly 75% up in my image because I think that's where this area of um, windowsill lies. So I'm just gonna pump up my brightness a little bit more and I'm happy with that result. Now. I could finesse my highlights a little bit more without having too much impact on my photograph by turning on my shadows and highlights. And what I'm going to do is just give myself a little boost. And you can see now the highlight slider affects from the mid range to the whites at the extreme right of my histogram. And I can use that slider in conjunction with the histogram to take my whites to a point where they might be going into a territory of specular highlights. You can see here it's a little bit too much. That's looking quite specular in as much it's looking a bit overexposed. And I'm just going to drop it down now so it's more in keeping with the circumstances in which I took this photograph. So that shows you quickly how you can use the histogram to get your black tones and your white tones correct. Now, the other thing you can do with the histogram is you can identify where there are color discrepancies. Now, I don't need to look at my histogram to look at this image and know there's a problem with my white balance. And ordinarily, you would look for an area of white in your image or neutral gray. And it's quite a potty process actually to identify an area of white and identify an area of gray. I'm just gonna go down to my white balance palette and I'm going to shift my white balance towards the blue. And you can see the effect I'm having on my histogram is I'm squashing my primary colors, my red, my green, and my blue together. And you can see the result on the photograph. It's a lot less yellow than it was. And to show you this, I'm just going to go up to my split view. And in fact, what I do, I'll use the mirror view. And you can see there the difference we've had. This was the original. And we can see we've improved the colors no end. And the other thing we've also done is we've corrected the contrast as well. So the picture's looking a lot more snappy, a lot more poppy. All right, so I just turn that off for now and go back to single view. And that cat is now looking a more smoky gray from what I remember when I took the photograph. And we can see our browns are still looking quite, quite natural and his eyes are looking beautiful. I really do love cats. Now, before I move on, I'm just gonna further demonstrate how the peaks 
indicate the number of pixels in your image. And I'm going to do this just by adding a bit of saturation to my image. So this is basically increasing colors in my photograph. You can see that the histogram is indicating the increase in, in colors in my overall image. So I'll just control and Z to return that to its proper state because I'm quite happy with the uh, actual saturation in my image. I'm now going to return to my color checker and we're going to move on now from the histogram to our scopes. And the first scope that we're faced with is the intensity waveform. Now the intensity waveform is a luminosity map of our image. We have our blacks in the bottom at zero and we have our whites at the top at 100. So we can see here clearly that each of our colors are represented by these white lines. And for instance, if I was just to select our bottom colors, you can see we have this stepped pattern on the screen and each of these lines represents our colors. On the left, we have white and on the right, we have our gray and we also have blacks. Now, I do believe there's a slight bug in Affinity Photo at the moment in as much the blacks are represented at the top of my intensity waveform where I would normally expect them to be represented at the bottom. I can only guess there's a bug that the developers need to iron out. So I won't worry too much about that right now. So you can see here as well that the actual white is on the left of our image and it is on the left of our intensity waveform. And that's because the intensity waveform is also a pictorial representation of our image. Not pictorial in the sense that you're used to, but in as much that all of the colors are present and they're located where they appear on the photograph. Now I'll demonstrate this. I'll just control and Z to return to our color checker and we'll return to our picture of the cat and we'll turn our scope back to intensity waveform. Now we can see on the waveform that there's a distinct line going from left to right. And because, as I said earlier, the whites are towards the top and the blacks are towards the bottom, I know this line is quite bright. And that line actually represents the windowsill. And you can see on the top of the windowsill, there's a highlight running along the edge. And that's represented by this faint line on our intensity waveform. So hopefully that shows you what I meant by a pictorial representation of our image. If we look here in the, on the left, we can see we've got a cluster of dark colors on the left in the bottom left hand corner. Now that doesn't mean they're going to be in the bottom left hand corner. It just means on the left hand side, we should find some darks, which we do in the window hinge here. And this cluster of pixels you see in the middle is our cat. And I can demonstrate that by using the crop tool. And we'll just crop up to our cat. And I'll press enter. And we can see there we've got this cluster of pixels from mid range to dark. So I'll just control and Z. And there we have mid range to dark. And from about a third of the way in from the left and a third of the way in from the right. And that's where our cat is. So hopefully that shows you how you can visually look at the intensity waveform and identify problems. Now, Earlier I showed you how to adjust a picture using the histogram. What I'll do now, I'll just reset my settings and return to our starting point. And I'm just going to show you quickly how you can edit a photograph using the intensity waveform. Now, as I said earlier, our highlights should be at the top and our shadow should be at the bottom. But what we can see here is the starting image is very much compressed and the majority of our colors are from the mid range to the darks, which is not where we want them. So obviously we need to make an adjustment to our whites. So to do this, I'm going to increase my brightness. I'm going to let go and you can see now we've had a marked effect on our image and it, we're not quite where I need to be. What I want to do is I want to get this lip, which we identified earlier, at roughly 80. So I'm just going to increase my brightness slightly more. Now I'm not going to adjust my highlights and shadows because I actually forgot to reset those earlier. In fact, what I'll do, I'll just nudge my highlights up slightly and that should take them to where I want them. And likewise, I'm just going to crush my blacks. You can see here, my blacks are towards the bottom end of where I really want them. And I'm just going to make sure they lie where they should. And I'm going to do this by increasing my black point. And I'm just going to push that up slightly until my indicators appear. There they are. Take it down. 
and take it down three. And there you have it. We've now corrected our image using the intensity waveform. But we also know that we've still got a color discrepancy. Now you can see from the intensity waveform that there are no actual visual reference to colors. But if I go to a drop down menu, we can get an RGB waveform, which is a similar waveform in as much it displays the same information, but it also displays our RGB color information. And this highlights to us the same discrepancy we saw earlier in our histogram, being the gap between the red and the green. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna fix that by using my white balance slider, and I'm just gonna slide my slider towards the blues just to get rid of that yellow. And we can see there now, we've had a marked effect. The blue and green are a little bit closer, which is where they should be. And the image is looking more like the cat I saw in Venice. Now it's looking a little bit underexposed. So what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna increase my brightness slightly. And I'm gonna drop my black point a little bit because it's looking a little bit too contrasty. And there we have it. I think that's a good uh, starting point for editing in the photo persona. Okay, so hopefully that shows you how you can use the RGB waveform and the intensity waveform to edit your image in a similar fashion to the way you use the histogram. And just a reminder again, don't rely on the scopes, rely on your eyes. Always refer back to the, the photograph as a reference. Okay, we're just gonna move back now to the RGB waveform just to show you again you can see the cat is here and the windowsill is there so it is exactly the same as as the uh, intensity waveform only in as much it introduces colors okay so hopefully that's explained that to you now we're going to go on to the RGB parade and the RGB parade again is very very similar to the intensity waveform and the RGB waveform in as much it gives a pictorial representation of your image. We can see here we've got our cat but it's been broken down into the RGB channels separately so it looks a lot less cluttered and again if I reset my image and reset my white balance you can see the discrepancy that we highlighted earlier using the histogram this should be more or less in line with the red and the green. So again, I'll just shift my slider. That's a little bit too much. And I'm gonna drop it. And that's where we should be. So you, you can see the RGB parade, whilst giving the same pictorial representation of your image in three channels, does a similar job to the other two scopes. And again, we can see our windowsill present in all three of the separate color channels. So hopefully that's explained to you how the RGB parade works. And it's very, very useful for correcting color discrepancies because it's a lot more visual than the other two scopes. So now we're just going to move on to the fourth of our scopes, and that is the power spectral density. Now this is where it gets all Star Trek. Now the power spectral density is a representation of the frequencies present in our image. The x-axis is the distance of our pixels from each other and the y-axis is the luminosity of our pixels. And what this image is telling me is that there are a lot of pixels in my image of varying frequencies. And now the only use I can find for this is noise analysis. And by this I mean if you were to zoom in on a dark area of your image, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll, we'll just go to our crop tool and we'll move it here. And we'll just crop off that little bit of window frame and press enter. You can see now that the number of pixels present has reduced. And because this shot was taken at an ISO of 100, which I can show you by looking at our EXIF information on the EXIF palette, it was shot at ISO 100, I wouldn't expect to see a lot of noise. So I'll just go back to our scope. Um, but what the scope is telling me is this, there is still a variety of tones in my image, albeit at the same frequency, which is what you'd expect from such a small area of your photograph. So I'm just gonna control and Z now to zoom out of that. And I'm gonna turn now to another photograph. Uh, we've got a photograph here of Jane, which I believe I've used in previous tutorials. And I'm gonna zoom in on Jane's arm here and I'm gonna turn on my power spectral density and I'm gonna crop a patch of Jane's skin and press enter. And you can see there now the number of pixels present has greatly reduced, but the spread is pretty even and that's because we've got one color tone. 
present. But what this is telling me is there is still a little bit of discrepancy between the pixels in as much the there's multiple frequencies present. Now, just for a second, I just want you to imagine that this is actually a noisy image as opposed to a bit of Jane's arm. So just to demonstrate how the power spectral density tool can help you, I'm just going to introduce an element of blur to this image. Now I'm going to use a Gaussian blur filter. If I slide my slider towards the right and introduce blur, you can see that the number of pixels present reduce. So I'll just turn that off. So hopefully that can show you how the PSD scope can be useful. But if there's anybody out there that can find a more useful use for the PSD scope, then please drop me a line and let me know. So I'm just going to press Ctrl and Z now on this image to return to our starting point. And we'll move on now to the last of our scopes, which is the vector scope. And we happen to be on the correct image now to demonstrate this. Now, the vector scope will be familiar to anybody that's used to editing video or using programs such as uh, Adobe Premiere or Blackmagic Resolve. And as much, this is a familiar tool used by videographers to get color tones correct, specifically getting skin tones correct, which is why Jane's the ideal model today. Now, what the vector scope represents is the various colors in an image and their saturation and intensity. We can see here our colors merge from the center and spread out towards this letter I in between the R and the Y. Now these letters R and Y represent red, yellow, and then we've got green, cyan, blue, and magenta. So this image we can see that our colors are orangey, red, yellow. So the direction of our pixels is therefore branching out towards red, and yellow. And this straight line here represents our skin tones. And that's the line you use as a guide when you're adjusting a photograph to get your skin tones correct. Now just reiterate, this cluster of pixels then are all of the colors in our image. And you can see they emanate from the center. Now the center spot would indicate zero color and zero saturation. And then any other pixels present outside that center spot then signify colors of varying intensities and varying saturation. Now I'm just going to demonstrate this now by introducing a white balance correction to this photograph. And I'm just going to turn on my white balance. And what I'm going to do now, I'm just going to shift the white balance towards blue and watch what happens to this cluster of pixels. You can see now it's shifted towards the blue circle of the vector scope. And again, if I introduce more amber or more yellow, it shifts more towards the yellow of our vector scope. So I'll bring that back. And likewise, I'll just put a magenta shift. And you can see there, we put a shift from our flesh tone towards magenta. And if I go to green, we've got a massive shift now towards green. So I'm just going to reset that now to where it should be. And you can see now that the colors have now fallen back along the guideline that indicates my, my flesh tones. And I know I'm close to the mark. I'll just switch off this white balance now and delete that by highlighting it and pressing delete. So hopefully that shows you how a vector scope can help you correct color tones in your portraits and photographs of people. Um, this line for skin tones is particularly useful. Um, it, it's also very, very useful for identifying color discrepancies in your images. So hopefully that's given you an insight into all the various scopes and a histogram within Affinity Photo, and I hope you found that useful. And that's the end of today's tutorial. Thanks very much for your time, and thanks for watching.